Awesome, awesome. Great to see you guys hopping on. Um, I'm Freya. I'm part of your CSO alumni board, and so is Emily. Emily, hi, Emily. Um, we're so excited to have you here um, for this wonderful opportunity to learn more about research tips and tricks from our lovely Dr. Sivy. Um, if you guys could please drop your names in the chat and where you're from. Um, if you could tell us maybe what you're looking forward to hearing about in today's session, those three things, we'd love to hear from you. So go ahead and drop that in the chat and we'll get started soon. You know, I uh, I should have talked to Emily more about this, but is the uh, the CSOs are all high school students, correct? Right. Yeah, so, so we invited no all juniors and seniors, perfect. those people who are going to be going Great. into college, who are getting good. prepared and excited. Good, good. good. And then yeah, we that's have right. uh, lots of college students, primarily college students, and then a couple of CSOs joining us today. Yeah, so I, I mainly made my talk geared toward those who aren't involved in research yet. And so those of you who are involved in research, I'd love for you to interject along the way about your experiences, um, because I think hearing from just old me about being a mentor in research isn't as helpful maybe as hearing from some of you about your experiences in doing research. So it'd be great if any of you CSOs and college students, you um, CSO alum and college students could contribute to the conversation, I'd be welcome very welcome to that. Perfect. Hi, Kat. Wonderful. Well, I think we see people dropping it in there. So um, again, thank you everybody for being here. We're super excited. We have a great mixture of people joining us today. Like we said before, we have CSOs that are juniors and seniors um, getting ready for college. Um, and then we have um, several who um, college students who are in STEM fields, um, some, you know, potentially not, but most people in STEM fields who are really excited about either doing research um, or in there in the middle of research, but are like, you know, what does good research look like? How do I make a poster presentation? Or, you know, how do I actually take all the knowledge that I get in research and digest it down so that other people actually understand what it is uh, that I've been doing and the research that I've, I've done. So um, we're super excited uh, to have Professor Sivy here from SVSU in Michigan. Um, and so I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Um, and it looks like we have a couple of people still connecting to audio. I'll chat them. They might have to jump out, jump back in. But um, and I'll, we'll keep admitting people as they come. So thanks for being here. Great, so I am going to try to share my screen now. Uh, share screen. I'm not sure if I've ever done this with Zoom. I've done it on Teams and, you know. If you hover over the bottom bar, will pop up and there's a share yeah, I have screen. share screen and it's asking one participant can share at a time. Is someone else sharing? Hmm. No, but here, we'll change that. Okay, go ahead and try it now. Okay. Mm. Why are you not letting me? Oh, there we go. Okay. Woohoo! Thank you. Oh, you're kidding me. I need to. <laughs> I've never allowed my laptop to share my screen. 
this is you know this is part of the whole thing everyone right right exactly it is technology at its finest yeah we <sighs> use, i've used teams I've used i know that's the problem what else have i used i think there's like google hangouts yeah google meets i think it's called now what else i blur i've used um meet now it's like all these different things and you know it's hilarious to figure out all the different platforms that are out there I'm so getting no there worries. getting You're good there. yeah no worries open oh, security and privacy to grant access it's also wow. i'm a mac i'm a mac person and i don't know why i stick with it because sometimes it's even more difficult oh i Maybe because I've been using Zoom for so long, I don't even remember having to do all that, but. Yeah, Mac has not, I mean, Zoom has not been what I use most of the time. So um, this is security and I apologize. I haven't, I haven't okay. really prepared too much um, to share with you because I wanna try to answer as many questions of yours as I can. So there will be plenty of time for that. And if you want, you can always email them to myself or Emily and we can share screen for you and we present no I'm problem right. whatsoever. Allow to access. Hold on. I'm... I feel like you're getting so close. I know. Privacy. Max are really hard. acting as if somebody's trying to change your last will and testament every time you like try to. I know, it. right? <laughs> it's crazy. And this coming from someone who uses a Mac and has the same password for everything. Like I know something in there doesn't make sense. <laughs> See, the thing is that it's telling me to go to the certain thing under settings, and it's not there. All right. Um. I'll just email these and um, so hope I'll email them to you just because I have your email right here. Yep, do it, I am ready. No, yours, the email I have from you is no reply at zoom. Oh, it's just... <laughs> here, so I'm gonna send out Emily because I okay. know I have Emily's address, all right? <laughs> Emily, are you okay with that? Yep, I'll get them up. Okay, so you'll just, you know, Again, this is pretty informal, so you'll just move on when I say move on. Sounds good. That's how we do it a lot with uh, yeah, okay. anyway, so it's perfect. All right. So they're just attaching to the email. Of course, that's taking a minute. So I'll just give you a minute about my background. Um, I have been, uh, I teach biochemistry at SVSU. Emily is a biochemistry major there, which is how I know her. Uh, we, uh, so we do a lot of undergraduate research, which is really impressive for a regional university. It's well-funded, um, from internal and external, um, sources. So that's pretty exciting for us. I would say that all of our chemistry and biochemistry majors have the opportunity to do research if they want, which is pretty awesome. Um, and but it's not that way at every college so sometimes you have to you know sort your way through things that are available to you and and i'll talk about that partly today for what for what um might be your options all right so um i went to a small liberal arts college um and so research was pretty available to me there i i didn't get involved until i was maybe a junior um, cause I didn't really know what career options were at that time. And I was given the opportunity to do research. Um, one of my, my, one of my professors approached me and said, would you like to do research with me? And I said, I don't know. Sure. And he said, I can, I can pay for you. Um, and so I said, sure, that sounds great. And it really paved the way for me realizing what it was that I wanted to do. Um, honestly, when I was doing undergraduate research, I realized that I didn't want to do research for a living, uh, which is fine, right? Um, but it did allow me to understand that I wanted to do something in science and in something that was going to have, uh, you know, at least 
peripherally something to do with research. Um, and it eventually led me to teaching. So I am going to talk about the whys, hows, and wheres of undergraduate research. And some of this will include how you can present your research um, and some of your various options. So if, if someone sees something in the chat, well, I can just move the chat over here. Good, I see it. All right, you can move on. All right, so, and again, I'm really willing to hear from anyone who wants to insert anything who's done undergraduate research. Um, and even from those who haven't done undergraduate research, who maybe have an idea about why you should do undergraduate research or why you might be interested in doing graduate research, undergraduate research. Um, but I have a list of some of the whys of the benefits of engaging in undergraduate research. So why number one is, and these are in no particular order, and you can go to the next slide, Emily. Uh, this is really what was one of the most important things to me. Uh, it allows you to explore school and career options. So I didn't really have any idea of what I wanted to do next. I was a biochemistry major in undergraduate school, um, but I didn't know if I wanted to continue with biochemistry and what I could do within biochemistry. But working with people outside of my classes and in a more intimate setting um, and a more independent setting allowed me to uh, kind of ascertain what was available to me uh, for the future. Um, so those of you who are high school students, I hope the college students know this, but it's not always necessarily the case. Um, uh, do you know that if you go on to get a PhD, that that is almost always paid for? You can go to school for free and you get a living stipend. You are kind of an indentured servant to the, the lab which you join, but you get a PhD out of it. You learn a lot and you don't go into debt which is pretty amazing. Uh, so in high school, I think a lot of us who are geared towards the sciences don't realize the options there are for profession, uh, for, for schools past undergraduate school. Uh, I didn't understand. Um, and my parents both have master's degrees, but I didn't understand what the options were for me. Um, I thought that really being a science oriented person, I needed to to go to medical school or pharmacy school or something like that, which of course, if that's what your path is, that's entirely appropriate, but making sure that you explore difference of these options is important before you make that jump from undergraduate to professional or graduate school. Um, and doing undergraduate research allows you to look more into those, those things which are available to you. Um, especially because you get to meet people who have been through similar pathways as you, who have probably looked into the different options available to you and you get to form more one-on-one -on -one relationships with them, your mentors and other, uh, other professors, faculty also, who are more than willing to share their experiences with you in almost every case. All right, and the benefit number two, Emily. One second, it froze, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. So this I think is a pretty obvious one, right? If you actually take the, the information that you're learning in class and you apply it in the lab setting, you're gonna understand better what you're learning in class. So this is just a given, more hands-on, more real life application, you're gonna understand better what you're, you're learning. And studies have shown that those who do undergraduate research almost always um, that translates into better grades and better content understanding for the subject that they are studying. So um, if nothing else, it helps you do better as an undergrad um, in college. So definitely consider undergrad research for this for this purpose. So those of you who are undergrads, do you find that you um, feel better prepared for what you're learning in class and, and understand better what you're learning in class? 
because you're doing undergraduate research? Does anyone want to jump in and share? Okay. I can share. Yeah, I was going to say, Freya or Emily, I know you guys are both doing, you ladies are doing research. If you wanted to share. Yeah, so I've been doing undergraduate research since my freshman year at college. And although at first I'm in an inorganic chemistry lab, so I haven't even taken the course yet or probably yeah. never will for my major. Right. But um, it's really helped me apply to anything I've learned in my earlier classes. Biochemistry last semester really helped tie the ends together between my research mm -hmm. and the content that I was learning. And just seeing the actual application of it makes it feel more real. It's not just something you're learning out of a textbook. So I think that's yeah. really beneficial. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. It makes it feel more real. Um, it's it's more believable what you're learning. Like you want to invest more into what you're learning when you see that it's actually applicable to real life and, and what's happening in the lab. Um, it very much increases your critical thinking ability because as I'll talk about in a minute, it doesn't go well in the lab most of the time. And so being able to work your way through what happens in the lab really allows you to assess critically what you think you should do in order to get it to work or what you um, maybe should stop doing in order to get it to work. So the, the content understanding, the critical thinking that results from undergraduate research is cannot be understated. It's incredibly important if you're interested in doing anything in the sciences, whether it be medical school or, or graduate school or anything of that case uh, uh, related to that. So, all right, and the benefit number three. Well, I think this is something Emily can probably speak to, and I, I'm not trying to pick on Emily, but I know that it's, it's made a difference in her life it's really hard, right, in sciences. And while many of you may be quite confident in your abilities, uh, you know, we, we science people often don't have the best social skills uh, or we think we don't have the best social skills. So being part of this group that's doing research and then presenting your research results as well as being able to critically think through what's happening in research, it can only benefit you in that it develops confidence. Um, so it gives you this, this additional opportunity to, to really develop as a person and develop in your thinking. Um, and I think developing your, your content understanding is, uh, is very confidence building also so that in your classes, you know, better how to study, how to understand the material and therefore do well in your courses. So I think confidence is one of the most important things that undergraduate research does for us. All right, number four. Okay, so it gives you transferable skills. So if you go out looking for a job after you're an undergrad, you can say, look, I've done this, this, and this. It means a lot more if you've done it many, many times as part of undergraduate research than just if you've done it one or two times as part of a lab course. Um, so many times in a lab course, you'll be able to touch instruments um, and do various methods and techniques, but you really don't become uh, very invested in that. You really don't at all become an expert in that. But if you are in doing independent undergraduate research, then your learning skills that, while you may not use those particular skills in the future, whether in graduate school or in the, the job market in, in a career, those are things that you can build on that you can use in order to understand and learn the work that you're going to do there. So um, as far as bolstering CVs, there is definitely a higher incidence. The percentage of people who are accepted to graduate schools and professional schools, as well as to jobs, um, it's much higher for those who, uh, who have engaged in undergraduate research because of that experience that they've gained uh, in developing their skills and in developing their critical thinking. They're, they're much more 
um, able to sell themselves for whatever they want to do next. So number five, ah, this is a pretty important one. Uh, and it, it sounds kind of negative, but it's actually an extremely a positive. So I know you all as CSOs, either past or alum, you are used to succeeding probably, right? And, and you know, we can be perfectionists and things. Scientists tend to be that way, but it, science doesn't, doesn't really work that way. There's going to be a lot of failure. Um, I don't mean getting Fs or something like that. I just mean things things that are real life don't work out the way that you necessarily expect them to. Um, and so when you are working through things in research and they don't go the way you want, you actually realize that you are capable of looking into how to make that project work. Um, troubleshooting is incredibly important in developing your critical thinking skills. Um, and, and it makes you re-question something like ignorance. So you may think that people are ignorant because they don't know the information, but research makes it so that you realize that you can dig in and develop your content understanding and develop your understanding of science and critical thinking um, and it makes you feel less ignorant, even if you aren't very, uh, very advanced in some sort of topic. You learn how to how to think about things in a different way. Failure and ignorance is not really uh, a bad thing anymore. It's something that allows you to grow and and to develop as a person and as a scientist. All right, and number six, it's satisfying. So when you do research, you're gonna be doing a real world uh, problem. Things don't get funding unless they have some sort of real life application. Uh, science is very expensive and there's limited funding. So whomever is funding the research wants to prove that it's going to be used to come up hopefully with some sort of answers. Um, and so you can contribute to the understanding of science and its various facets and, and subdisciplines in the real world. And there's, there's such a feeling of satisfaction that comes from that. So this goes back to building your confidence and making you more, um, more attractive to graduate schools and uh, professional schools and jobs. It's, it's just satisfying whether you come up with really deep answers or whether you just, you know, skim the surface of what you're working on every little thing that goes well for you, every little thing that you're able to solve. It's really, really amazing and satisfying, um, to have that occur. And so doing this, doing independent research is, is, is really one of the most satisfying things you can do as a college student, in my opinion, even if it doesn't go well. Okay, so does anyone else wanna contribute some benefits that they've experienced from undergraduate research or expand on some of what I've kind of highlighted? Again, all these things are very well supported in the literature. So this isn't, these aren't just bullet points that I've made up. Um, but I'd love to hear from anyone doing this themselves. I do have to compliment you on like putting all this stuff together. I think this is really helpful for students who are in the process of cold emailing oh, labs good. or interviewing with yeah. labs, just because yeah. a lot of people send out emails to labs. They're like, I want to be an undergraduate researcher for you. <laughs> and then you get an interview and they're like, why? People are like, because your work is interesting. And people say I should yeah, do this. There's, like there's these are more all to good. It than that, right? <laughs> there are yeah. all good reasons um, because people don't expect you to like want to help them because you want to help them. They expect you to like have some idea of what you also want to get out of the experience. It shows right. that you understand what you're getting yourself into. So these are all great things for you guys to bring up um, or lightly mention in your cold emails, in your interviews you'll have with different labs. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I do want to back up the fact um, about if like you're not really feeling like STEM is for you. I know that I always felt like I was I was good at like talking to people and like teaching people and things. And then like I was like, I, I don't tell. know if like oh thank you, thank you, vibes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, can I like, you know, do like heavy research? But I think doing like being in a lab, you will understand like everybody has like different strengths and some people will appreciate like your particular strengths. Um, right. And you'll get to work on whatever you're not as confident in, in like kind of like a real world situation. Like it forces you to work on those things, but like no one's mad at you when you fail because you are just the undergrad. Like you not are just the all. undergrad. You are allowed to right. mess up your Western blot. Like <laughs> No, we expect it. We expect it to happen. And we hope you can learn from it because those of us who mentor undergraduate um, students, we want it to be a fulfilling um, experience for them. Uh, so, so we accept all of those things and we hope that the undergrads will grow from it. Um, so yeah, fail fast, fail forward, fail smart, perfect. <laughs> right, fail forward, right? Figure it out and move on, just move on. It's okay to fail. You can learn more from your failures than you can from your successes if all you have are successes. So, okay, so the where's or what is my next category? So this was the why's, the how's, the how's. Okay, so um, I don't know what your undergraduate institutions have or what they will have, but this is how it works at ours and how it worked at my previous where I went to college as well as where I went to graduate school. So I went, like I said, I went to college at a small liberal arts college, and then I went to graduate school at a research one institution, which tends to be the case um, for them to have supported PhD programs. Um, so on campus, there are usually a lot of different opportunities for undergraduate research. Uh, there's many times paid positions. It depends on the institution, how many of these are available. And it, it also depends on um, the faculty mentor as to how well-funded their research project is. So um, there were many years where I, was, I couldn't pay very many students um, to do undergraduate research, um, but then I got some internal funding to support that. And now I have a, a plethora of funding, which actually isn't that that common for a regional university. So I pay five students at a time to do 30 hours of research a week. Um, but like I said, it's, it's different for every university and it's different for every faculty mentor. So you just need to be aware of that, that if someone turns you down for undergraduate research and they blame uh, funding, they probably are being truthful. It's not something that they're making up to get rid of you, so you shouldn't take it personally. It's really expensive to do research, and if they tell you they can't afford you, they most likely are telling you the truth. Um, so if there aren't paid research opportunities, there's also probably honors theses um, opportunities, uh, where you can work through some sort of specific hypothesis or problem and then present it at the end as your honors thesis, uh, which I know Emily's doing what next week or so. Um, and almost always there will be an opportunity where you can take uh, independent research as credit. So this is a great way to, if you would like to, or support, uh, if your GPA is fine and you don't need to bolster it, but you'd like to support a specific um, high GPA or something, if you take undergraduate research as credit and you do a good job at it, you'll you'll most likely get a good um, a good grade from your faculty mentor. So while you have to pay for these credits, it's still invaluable experience. Uh, so on campus, you know, there's usually, depending on your university, your college, there's usually a variety of different ways that you can get involved in research. Um, and so just explore what your university has to offer uh, for getting involved. And then many different 
Universities have partnerships with um, off-campus um, places. So we are 20 minutes from Dow Chemical um, here in Michigan, which is an amazing opportunity for many of our students. So they do um, internships internships and co-ops over there. I think doing on-campus research is more meaningful because, uh, well, I'm, I'm biased, but also uh, they get to do more independent work than they would at a research um, company where things are much more tight and, and they need to make sure that, that they're, you know, fulfilling all of what they're being um, asked to do. Um, so, but this is definitely something you can explore if there's off-campus internships, especially maybe for the summertime um, that you can do in order for you to be able to explore different options for, um, for research. And it's a good idea uh, for off-campus in internships. They allow you to explore what industry is like, because if you do end up wanting to be a scientist, Eventually, you're going to have to decide whether you want to be more in academics and teaching or whether you want to be more in industry as well. You know, there's other options too, like government jobs um, and, and things like that. But really, your first cut is going to be, do I want to do academics? And then within academics, do I want to be focused more on teaching or do I want to be focused more on research? And then... The other side of academics is industry. Which one is most appealing to me and where can I see myself making the biggest impact and where can I see myself being the most fulfilled? So um, that's something that's worth exploring as an undergrad and which you'll get to look into more as you move on after your undergraduate career. So next. So as Freya was saying, you can cold email people who are doing research. This is great. Uh, don't be surprised if uh, faculty don't respond. You get a lot of emails. Don't let that hold you back. Um, we at our chemistry department, which biochemistry is a part of our chemistry department. This is just one page of it, but we pass out these sheets that have little blurbs on the research that each, each faculty member is doing. And so if you go and ask the department secretary or the department chair, they should hopefully have something like this available to you where you can get an overview of the different types of research that are happening in the department. So read through these carefully and see what strikes you as being interesting and what you can really see yourself dedicating yourself to because I, undergraduate research is not easy. It's hard, but again, it's very satisfying and very fulfilling, but it's one of those things that you really get out of it, what you put into it. So make sure that you're picking a project that you can see yourself working on. Um, even when you're early in your um, college career, if, so I do biochemistry and people, my students don't take the biochemistry class until they're juniors and seniors in college, but I love to get them involved in the lab when they're freshmen and sophomores. And I don't actually see them in the class when they're freshmen and sophomores. So I ask my colleagues who are teaching the freshmen and sophomores. And I, um, I kind of, when I advertise for positions, I say, you know, younger students are, are welcome to apply to. And so don't be scared to go and um, put yourself out there, as my, my point here says. Um, even if you're not confident about yourself, act confident. Um, be, a, be an advocate for yourself. So if you're not, if you're cold emailing various faculty mentors saying, I'd like to work on research with you, um, and you're not getting responses, go knock on their doors. Find out when their office hours are. Don't be pushy, but let yourself be known to people with whom you'd like to do research. Because the more we see you, the more we remember you. And then when we do have positions open, we will know that you're interested and we will urge you to apply. We will urge you to come back and chat with us. So if you're not getting a response, don't let that be the end of it. 
go and advocate for yourself. One thing that you need to consider is what kind of research mentor you would like to work with. Um, this is important in undergrad. It's probably more important in graduate school, but what I mean by this is, do you want a faculty mentor who's in the lab standing over your shoulder all the time? Do you feel very self, um, do, you, do you have a lot of self-doubt that you feel like you would like a lot of help? Or do you want someone who's gonna kind of let you work independently? Um, there, so micromanager or macro manager, and, and then there's various shades in between. This is something that you can talk to the other students um, who work with various of the faculty mentors, you can get kind of a, an idea of what kind of faculty member each of those uh, researchers are. Um, and you may not know. And if you don't like the lab you're working in when you first start, and I mean working in like for credit or for paid research or for your honors thesis, don't be very afraid to switch, but at the same time, you should always give something a good shot for a while um, because sometimes you just need to settle in and figure out how things work. Uh, it's also a big decision for the, for the faculty mentor because they want to see that you are, um, are going to be dedicated to what they need you to do because undergraduate research is important to the faculty mentor because this is how we get our research done. So at Research One institutions, um, so I went to University of Colorado for my PhD and there we had, you know, this, this professor who was the head of our lab, the PI, private, um, private investigator, <laughs> the primary investigator. He wrote all the grants, wrote all the reports and things like that. He made sure there was funding for our work. Um, and we had some undergrads in the lab, but they really only did the dishes. During my years of graduate school, I, I saw maybe one or two undergraduate researchers who actually got to pipette things and take part in, in research activities. So if you're at a research one institution, make sure that you check into that. If you're interested in doing dishes and just hanging out in a lab, which is beneficial on its own because you get to see how it works, um, that's great. If you want to actually participate in the research, you need to make sure that that is available to the undergrads in that research. If you're at a, you know, primarily undergraduate institution where the undergrads are doing the bulk of the research or all of the research, um, that is, that's something to realize that your research mentor is somewhat relying on you to fulfill the work plan of the grants um, for which he or she has applied. So, um, so just some of this, if you don't understand what I'm saying, cause you haven't experienced it yet, that's fine. But I'm just saying it's, it's a big decision for everyone. So, so do your due diligence and get out there and make yourself known because you're more likely to be able to land a spot in a lab if um, the mentors know what you are, who you are, and uh, what you're about. And by the way, one of the things I didn't write and I should have is perhaps the biggest benefit of undergraduate research is that you develop that mentorship relationship with the faculty member. And the, the more the faculty member gets to learn to learn, learn to know you, the better they can advocate for you as you move on in your career and the better they can advise you on what it is that you want to do next. Uh, that the students that just kind of move through our department, take our classes and don't really engage in some of the activities of the department, including undergraduate research. When they come and ask for um, recommendations, it's very difficult for us to write them. But if I have someone working in my lab, I will write pages describing what their strengths are. Um, I will advocate for them uh, as much as I feel that they deserve. Um, and almost always I deserve, they, they feel me to, they, they deserve me helping them as much as I possibly can with, with what comes next. So, so don't give up, keep, keep pushing without being pushy. 
for getting a spot in a lab, if that makes any sense, right? All right. Okay, next screen. Okay, so these are three bullet points that I think the first one needs the most explanation. So if you take undergraduate, if you do undergraduate research, not only will it lead you to where you're gonna go next in your career or for graduate school, but the research culture is really something to behold. Um, speaking with other scientists and kind of bouncing ideas off them and working together, science is so collaborative and not just science, uh, everything in life, in academia, in industry is extremely collaborative. So the better you can understand about that collaborative nature of research, no matter what the discipline it's in, it it, it, it is really a benefit for you as you move forward in life and into a career to understand what the culture is in that discipline um, and to gain understanding from those around you who are working on similar issues, similar problems, even if it's not exactly the same thing as you. Uh, most undergraduate labs will have multiple students working. So those people can be great friends to you, even if you don't really have anything in common, you have this in common. And so you can bounce ideas off each other. You can um, share things with each other. I um, So I have two students right now who um, didn't know each other until three years ago when they started working in the lab together. And seriously, I don't think I ever see them separated from each other now. It's kind of disturbing, in fact, that they're always together. And they that's because of the experience that they've had in the lab together. Um, and I'm not saying you're going to become best friends with the people you work with in the lab, but, but it's something that uh, can be very beneficial to your growth as a a collaborator as, as a person, as, as someone who learns to communicate with others. Um, labs are strange places and research culture is strange since sometimes, but it's a beautiful thing. And so it's great if you can immerse yourself into, in that as an undergrad and, and learn about it as best you can. Um, it's pretty rare, but sometimes undergraduates can be co-authors on journal articles. If this happens, it's sometimes a lucky thing. Um, it's sometimes a factor of where in their career your faculty mentor is. So are they early in their career and they're trying to publish a lot? Um, or are they, you know, past, um, uh, past promotion and they don't need to publish as much anymore? Uh, again, that's something that you should kind of look into when you're ascertaining which labs you would be interested in joining, where in their career is the person with whom you're considering doing research. Um, Cause that often makes a difference as to how hands-on they are. Um, so sometimes you will be a co-author in a journal article. And if this happens, it's awesome. Um, but again, it's pretty rare for an undergrad. Now, one thing that undergrads often get to do is go to conferences. Um, these can be conferences that are general conferences that maybe are big conferences where a whole bunch of different sub, sub disciplines are being presented or they can be very specific conferences. So I take my students to smaller conferences with about a hundred people where we present on research that's very closely related to the research on what everyone else at that conference is doing. And then just last week, we were at a conference where there were, uh, I think the total was 12,000 people, I don't know, 4,000 undergrads, hundreds of posters being presented. Um, and so that's very much more general and that's more of an experience and learning about the research culture than it is about getting feedback on your particular research. So there's two different types of conferences. There's conferences specific to your research where you can learn how to grow your research and troubleshoot in your research and move on in your research. And then there's general conferences where you learn more about research culture and get to um, get to form connections with other people, um, which is also very beneficial because you can 
get to know people for graduate school and things like that. So at conferences, undergraduates will tend to present their research as, next slide, posters. So posters, um, as the name implies, uh, they are something you just tack up on a board and then people will come by and look at them. Um, when you are presenting a poster, you will be standing by the poster most of the time, um, but you should design a poster to be self-explanatory. That is, if someone comes up and you're not there, they can understand what the basis for your work is uh, without you needing to verbally explain it to them. Um, so as I write here, most of the details can be gained just by reading and looking at the figures. And then you have some sort of overview of the materials and methods that have gone into the work. So next slide. So those of you who are in college have certainly written uh, formal lab reports. Um, those of you who are still going on to college will be writing formal lab reports, many of them, and perhaps you do that. Um, and high school also, but posters need to have all of the same information um, that's presented in lab reports, such as abstract, introduction, materials and methods, results, conclusions, and always make sure you have references um, because you need to cite uh, how you came up with the, the process that you're doing. And then another thing that's often included on posters is acknowledgements where you say who's, who specifically has provided funding, who's helped you um, in developing your research skills and in working on the poster. Um, so the difference between a poster and a formal lab report is that it should be much less wordy you want it to be eye-catching. You want it to be where someone will actually stand and look at it all. And they're not going to read a formal lab report that's tacked up on the wall. No one wants to do that. Your professors don't even want to do it really that much <laughs> when you turn them in. So um, it does need to be thorough in what's being presented, but you also want to be careful in how you're presenting that. All right, next slide. So some design points, you really want quite a bit of results. You want it to be presented in graphs and tables that are easily understandable. Um, and the text that's included in, uh, on, the, on the poster and the graph should be readable from, this is just a general, maybe about four feet away. This is just to provide, well, maybe I should say six feet away now with social distancing, but people will tend to stand about four feet away from your poster. And so um, they sh it should be readable from that distance. Um, you should make your poster attractive, make it draw people in. Um, a well done poster will draw more people and more discussion. Even if you don't want to talk to people walking by your poster, it's really good for you. This improves your confidence and improves your, improves your content understanding. You can often get good suggestions for what you can do to um, benefit your research. So if you make your poster so that people will want to talk to you about it, that's a very good thing. Um, your poster can be pretty bland, um, but you can have pictures and things on it. Uh, it's, it's really kind of how you want to present it. Uh, typically using pictures uh, and maps and graphs and things makes it more attractive to people who are walking by and they may be more likely to stop by and look at them. Are there, are there questions so far before I move on? I've just been talking, talking. Great. I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but if anybody okay. has them, feel free to put those in there. Um, but you're talking and talking is great. I mean, okay, I, okay, it's great stuff. Thank you. All right, next slide. So this is an example of a poster session. It's kind of scary, isn't it? So you have these boards, and then the posters, as you can see, are tacked up on the boards, and people are standing by their posters. And then people are walking around 
and they go up and look at a poster. And if they're interested, they'll ask you questions or they'll say, explain your research to me. And you should have everything there on your poster so that you can do an accurate and thorough description of what you've done and what your results are. Um, and like I said in the previous slide, this is good. Even if you're shy and you don't want to talk about it, this is all the part of developing your skills as a scientist or in whatever discipline you work. Being able to present your work to others is extremely important, uh, whether it be in the sciences or whether it be in the humanities or whatever. So communication via posters is is really a great way to develop as a member of the society, science society, humanities society, history, you know, history, social sciences, whatever it may be. As a, a future member or current member of that society, being able to communicate by way of poster and explanation of that poster is extraordinarily important. And you're not just going to present a poster unless you've done some sort of work to lead to that poster. So doing undergraduate research that leads to a poster presentation is, is really, really something that makes you attractive to what, what you're hoping to do next after your undergraduate education. And you should be very willing to share your work. And you should always realize that it's your work and you probably understand it better than anyone who's gonna stop by and ask you questions about it. And if there are people who know more about what you're working on than you, they're probably just gonna stop by with helpful suggestions and they wanna help you. So most people are not cruel and most people wanna be helpful and most people are just interested in what you're doing. So take the, the poster session as a learning experience. Um, as a way to develop your confidence and your communication skills. All right, I think the next slide I had was like an example of a poster. Um, and I don't have that here. So Emily, I'm going to send you a poster. And then I'm just going to show you the poster that my students just um, just presented at the American Chemical Society last week. It's not a perfect poster. And in fact, you can all tell me what you think is wrong with it. They made the poster <laughs> and I had a few comments on it. Um, we fixed typos and things, but um, it may be something that you say, hey, I have a problem with this poster and I, I would suggest you interject. In the meanwhile, does anyone have anything you undergrads, do you have anything you want to add? Those of you who have done research, you high school students, is there anything that you have for questions? I just dropped in the chat to some different options. If you're in engineering, there's a Grand Challenge Scholars Program at a lot of engineering yeah. schools, which mm -hmm. has great research. So, um, you know, ask about that. I love the advice of, um, you know, like go to your clubs and orgs, maybe you as a freshman, yes. your first year, right? You're like, you ask, you send these cold calls and, or cold emails and they're, you get nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Start joining clubs and orgs, get to know people in there, start talking to them. Where did you do your research? Right. Um, are you doing research? Oh my gosh. Do you think that sounds really cool? You know, how did you get in? Start asking people for that sort of advice. They might yes. even you know, introduce you to their faculty member if they think that you're you're doing some really great uh, work. Um, so do things like that. If you're looking for external um, tallow, which is one of our partners with SciTech Institute, does a really great job. It's for all around the U.S. and I think and also Mexico. They have tons of different research and um, uh, and internships all around paid and unpaid okay. so going there and like sometimes just you know I hear this um, often from students well nobody wants to hire me in their lab because I don't have any experience well so go do an unpaid research do it for credit pay for that credit that yes. independent research that you Perfect. said right like do some of those things your honors thesis so that you have that information um to share. So Freya, it looks like you've got 
lots of stuff in here. She said, Freya, tell us a little bit about this. And so while like people are looking for poster examples, I would say like, it depends on a little bit what like your specialty is and like what your mentor specialty is. So uh, mostly I do like remote um, psychology research. I'm interested in mental health. Um, you'll see it in our bulletin, check it out. Um, so I also do psychology research at the U of A. So this is one of my mentors posters. I think my name is on this one because I like contributed to the data, but it's a little more like there weren't as many pretty pictures associated with this type of poster, but in the category it was in, this was a winning poster for um, like his area of like um, assessing like Alzheimer's versus aging versus thoughts. Um, the poster that I dropped in with the painfully green headings um, is like kind of what I was working on with my biochemistry project. So um, that one is definitely more, see like, look at these nice light colors. My poster isn't quite there yet. Um, <laughs> Um, so even if like you're not in a type of research where like you get pretty pictures, you can make pretty pictures. Um, they will give you sure. awards for doing right. this. Yep. Yes. Like, <laughs> um, and so like, if like people love creatives and research too, um, graphic design is yes. Um, but if you are in a field where you can take pretty pictures of your work, you can take pictures of your Western bot and stuff like that. Just be aware that like, your work might not always be picture worthy. Like my Western blots, not quite something you want to see in a published paper yet. Still working on that. Um, but eventually we'll get to that point um, and take some gorgeous pictures. I did not take the pictures that are on this poster that was um, done by the PhD students in my lab. Um, <laughs> the, I can only claim the diagrams. Um, yes, which are white. Wow, maybe I should get you guys a different bio render is really not doing any services. Um, I really like the, I really like the green on this one. It draws your really? eye, right? Really, I do. Um, people are so polarized by it. Oh, um, really? It's just like you know, because I haven't. It catches your eye. That's Thank all, you. right? Thank you. That's what I was thinking at first. Thank you. Um, well, and I think it goes well with the pictures that you have in your introduction. Yeah, I think part of it is. I I really only know the engineering ones. I spent a lot of time in engineering, but it's like. The posters, you know, again, it's like the the headers go with the pictures, right? So if you had these bold, crazy pictures, you know, like again, make it aesthetically pleasing so they're not contrasting one another, um, and it looks like you know Skittles threw up on a on a page, <laughs> right? Yeah, so aesthetically sure pleasing. Yeah, complement one another. And if you don't know what that looks like, you're like, I don't know. Find a friend, you know to say, here's your five colors, use Canva if you need to go in, it'll give you all colors that match each other. And then yeah. you think about it. <laughs> Good advice. So one thing I was gonna have Emily show you and she brings up my poster if she can is how do you make a poster like this? Like you will hopefully have guidance from your um, faculty advisor. And by the way, this turned out much better as a printout. Like these graphs look all, kind of wonky here, but it looks great as a printout. But one thing to realize is this is um, this most of these posters are done in PowerPoint where you set the page size to be like three feet by four feet. So what you do to put these things together is you develop all the different panels as separate PowerPoint slides, and then you slide them into the um, into the poster as they fit. So it's printed out as one big poster. All right, this is one huge PowerPoint slide. Um, and so can you show them that Emily, like if you go into the PowerPoint settings, just so they can see the page setup, it's something that I didn't understand for a long time. So I just wanna make sure that, that you can see how this is done. Um, yep. So if you go into file page setup, oh, of course it's different in yours, which is not my Mac. Yeah. So under print, is it where you choose? No, shucks. I know how to do it on my Mac, but in page setup, you pick the size that you want your poster to be. Um, which allows it to be printed out as one big sheet. 
Okay. So yeah, there, right? Um, so somewhere in yep. your PowerPoint program, it allows you to set. So if you think about how huge this is, 45 inches by 36 inches, most of these poster printers have a maximum um, depth of 33 feet, 36 inches. So then you can play around a bit with the length of it. Um, but the 36 inches is pretty standard. So if you think about how much you can fit on a 36, a three foot deep um, poster, it's a lot of stuff. Now, I will tell you what I don't like about this poster and what I told my two students here, these are the two who are joined at the hip now. Um, I think it's too dark. It ended up not being too dark when it was printed out, but it's still on the dark side. But one thing that I do like about it is that they include kind of a diagram of their methods because they have really, really complicated methods. So they have a diagram of their methods. I know Emily just presented a poster and she did a great job of showing the synthesis schematic of what she was working on. So I think it's important for the methods that you show some figures that describe what you're doing. If you're making a paper or a formal report, you're not going to have diagrams usually that describe your method. But in a poster, they're very helpful as you're explaining what you've done to be able to say, these were the steps that I took and to show them in some sort of picture presentation or flowchart presentation. Um, so posters are a great way to present that very systematically to people with diagrams and figures and things like that. Uh, anyways, I hope that made sense. If you haven't made a poster, it probably doesn't so much, but when you do make a poster, maybe these words will come back to you that uh, presenting your methods as, uh, I, I would rather they're presented more as bullet points than how they're presented here in this long paragraph, but I appreciated that they made this flow chart for how the methods work. Um, and then just as you would in a paper, you have to have um, a, you have to describe what's in each of the figures. Um, you need to be clear on if you're making graphs, what the axis labels are. Um, it's these results have to be very formal um, on a poster. They're permanent, okay? So everyone needs to make sure that they're done really well. Um, one thing that they're missing here, which bothers me is references, um, but references are also kind of included in their acknowledgement. So there's kind of a little leeway there, but they have included the funding agencies as, you know, kind of co-partners on the, on the poster. So anyways, I think this poster is too dark, but I do think having the coronavirus in the background <laughs> makes it kind of draw the eye to it. So I guess, you know, without me getting into a research talk, um, I just wanted to show you examples of posters and I wanted to make sure that you understood that these are these are one big sheet of paper and you can set that up in PowerPoint so that they're printed that way. Cause that's something I didn't understand even when I had my PhD. Cause when I was in graduate school we didn't really have poster printers like this. So pretty sad, right? All right, I guess that is my last slide was just, do you have questions? Do you have discussion, comments, anything about why you should do research, you know, how you get involved in research or how you present your research. Um, there's several people here I think would be willing to, to give you some suggestions or, or tell about their experiences. Anybody have any questions? I think that was fantastic. And I love that we were able to record it as well. Um, you know, and I think this will be great. We have several CSOs who are doing, um, who are seniors who are doing research uh, for projects that we have right. with mm -hmm. different universities. So I think yeah. this is going to be great and the transferableness of that in high school to the university. And I think for our alum, you know, I got emails, I can't attend, but oh, I want the recording because I think the two big 
I love that ha the three components and it was the why and they might know the why, but I love Freya, your point of you might think you know your why and then you don't. And then you get an opportunity and you blow it because you didn't actually know your why. So having those six yeah. tips, like going and being like, oh, I actually know my why was just so great. And then the second part is how do you get research? Be creative, right? So there are I had never so thought of going to somebody's office hours. Like, I don't know. I've just like emailed yeah. people after five days, but I don't know. Like that didn't seem intuitive to me. So I thought it was a great Great thing of yeah, out. I mean, sometimes it may not work out for you, but almost if you can't find always, them, but <laughs> almost always that's the way to do it. If you don't get an email response, in fact, I might even suggest doing that first because professors are inundated, inundated with emails, and if they don't recognize the person and it's something that they don't need to respond to right away, they may just it may just go into the black hole. So going and introducing yourself go such a long ways. Um, I cannot stress that enough. Just making an impression on them. And most of the research students that I've hired have been those who have stopped by my office and said, I'm interested in doing research, or they've been recommended by my current research students. So making those connections with clubs and organizations, as Hope said, and and other students who are already working in labs, that's really how you're gonna gain footing to get these positions. Make yourself known, put yourself out there. And then, yeah, and then, you know, putting it, you know, and just being like, hey, okay, I might not be able to do research right now here, but going and doing something that's like research later, uh, or sorry, outside of getting, getting paid. So now you have the experience I think is vital. And then I love um, the poster, right? I mean, I don't think everybody understands. I've seen a million and five poster presentations that, you know, because of the jobs that I've had. But I remember the first time going being like, why are there posters all, what is happening? You know, <laughs> and it's just a very different. So I think this will be super um, beneficial to everybody who, signed up and we can use this again and again if that's okay with you i know sure <laughs> sure yeah well i know no, several I, people had to jump off too for class yeah. so if you're wondering where people had to jump off to but i do love that picture of the poster presentations that i found because mm -hmm. it really is shocking your first poster <laughs> like your first real poster session that you go to you're like what is this what is happening here? I remember my first poster session being, this is not what I expected. So I think just as much as you can visualize it before you get there, it allows you to prepare yourself for what's to come. Uh, anyways, I liked that picture because it shows it can be pretty busy and there can be many, many posters there, right? Yeah. I've had, I had went to several poster presentations and then for my grad program did my own and I was like, oh, I got this. I've been to so many of these. I know what this right. looks like. Thank goodness. Yeah. Now I know what makes a good poster, what exactly. doesn't, I know how to interact because exactly. I just went and observed other poster presentations. They weren't necessarily mine, but right. I thought that was so beneficial because then when I had to do my own, I was like, got it, no problem. Exactly. So, well, I think with that, um, I know a lot of people, like I said, had to jump off for class, but thank you so much. This was just perfect and great. And thank you, Emily, for reaching out um, to Dr. Siddhi to join us today and um, just really appreciate your time um, and giving it to both our CSO alum, our current CSO, and then we just had super cool, awesome college students who wanted to join as well. Awesome. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Have a great rest of your night. I know it's eight o'clock there, so. Yep, gonna go put the kids to bed, I think now. I like but, it. All yeah. right, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Bye. Bye.